Scottish culture, Scottish soul, but how to translate that popular feeling into political action. In 1997, the key lay in the devolution referendum. Scots said yes by a big majority. Ironically, the referendum plan caused a huge row when it was first announced. Well, it's a massive retreat from the Labour Party. For six years, they've been telling us that a referendum isn't necessary, that a general election would be the test. Now they're looking for a bolt hole, an escape hatch. Blair faced even bigger objections from his own party. Until you got to the truly bizarre situation where people would say, by giving the Scottish people a direct say, <laughs> you know, somehow belittling the Scottish people. And I'd say, well, but they can come and vote for it. Um, and actually, I was quite sure that people would, especially done in the first flush of enthusiasm for a new government. But I also was absolutely convinced, and I still am, that unless we had got a definitive view expressed in a referendum first, we would never have got the legislation through. Scotland votes yes, yes, for its own parliament with the power to raise taxes. It's good to see you, Donald. Satisfactory, I think. Very satisfactory, satisfactory. and well done. Yes, well, well done indeed. Look. Great to see you. I suppose you're all exhausted, eh? Just <laughs> been up all the night. Well, when well, are you going to start sleeping then? <laughs> Ready for the next one yeah. So Scots got what they wanted that day, but are they satisfied still, or do they hanker for more? Labour were driven to create a Scottish Parliament by that sense of Scottish identity. But of course, that very self-same sense of identity created the Scottish National Party in the first place. Winifred Margaret Ewing, Scottish National 18,397. Winnie Ewing's Hamilton by-election victory in 1967 marked the birth of the modern SNP. She served in the devolved parliament, but remains restless. We regarded it as a necessary step on the way to independence. We never thought it was an end in itself. We just hoped that we would do well enough to convince people we were making a better job of it than London. What I think will happen in Scotland is that people will take a meaningful degree of devolution as a first step. They will then want control of the Scottish economy because in particular what people in Scotland want is to turn the capital assets of North Sea oil into the new capital assets of new industry, new jobs in Scotland in the future. George Reid was one of the squad of nationalist MPs elected in the 1970s. First seven of them, later 11. The stirring in the Scottish spirit disturbed Westminster then, but George Reid stresses it's a much older story. I think it's shaped by the people who have gone before. You've got to go a long way back. Uh, if Scots hadn't fought in the wars of independence, we'd be North Britain. If the negotiators of the Treaty of Union hadn't kept all the institutional carriers of identity in place, separate law, separate church, separate administration, we'd be North Britain. And I think the British Union worked perfectly well until the state began to get into difficulties in the 60s, until we got into a democratic deficit, Scotland voting one way, getting a government it didn't vote for. And there was a gradual realisation that uh, maybe we should take a bit of the past back, uh, maybe we should in Scotland address our own particular issues. <laughs> and so Scotland elected the members of her devolved parliament. When they first met, it fell to Winnie Ewing as the oldest member to echo centuries of Scottish history, Scottish soul. The Scottish parliament adjourned on the 25th day of March in the year 1707 is hereby reconvened. <laughs> because that was the promise I made to Robert McIntyre on his deathbed, our first ever SNB member, the Provost of Stirling, 
in his deathbed, he said, now somebody must say this, because it's a fact that the parliament was never dissolved, it was only adjourned. Someone must say this to give the continuity of history. And I said, well, if it's me, Robert, I will assure you I will say that. And that's what I did. Ten years ago, a grand royal opening for Scotland's new parliament. But regal ceremony was counterbalanced with a popular touch. Then let us pray that come it may, as come it will for all that, that sense and work are all the earth shall bear the grief. Burns' anthem to common humanity. Those present got the message, a gentle, melodious reminder of Scotland's own self-image one of equality, one where merit mattered more than rank. And those present also understood responsibility rested with them now. What did it feel like for you sitting in that, as Winnie Ewing called it, reconvened parliament? The start of a new Scotland, the chance to address Scottish problems, uh, the end of blaming somebody else in London. If we made mistakes in future, they were to be our mistakes, and we made a few of these too. And simply a country, a very old country, taking control of its domestic life again. And so our MSPs got to work, and mostly they tried to work in keeping with their sense of Scottish identity. To be Scottish, they believe, meant feudal land reform. To be Scottish, for them, meant equality, a fairer deal for children, the elderly, the homeless. But all their efforts to capture the spirit of Scotland ran into a huge concrete obstacle, this building. Voters had been told to expect something basic for £40 million. They got a palace of modern architecture for £400 million plus. As presiding officer, David Steele was landed with the building project and that early estimate. There was no building, there was no choice of site, there was no choice of architect, there was nothing. It, was a, it wasn't an estimate, it was a guesstimate. But it has come back to haunt us all the time because people say, well, it began at 40 million and end up as 400 million. Nonsense. It never began at 40 million at all. But the people were simply furious. Their confidence in devolution was undermined. Govern ourselves. We can't even finish a building on time. You can see when we talked about an open and inclusive parliament, it's that. It is very open. A building at 60 metres by 30. Uh, everyone has the best seat in the house because there are no pillars. Because of the delays, because of the uncertainty, because there was no indication of when the thing was going to be finished, that became devolution. That became the story. And no matter how much people tried, the new politics, the new initiatives, it was always the bloody building that was in the headlines. The gloom afflicted an unlikely target. Even supremely confident Alex Salmond began to harbour doubts about himself, or at least his public image. And so he quit as SNP leader. 